Hey everybody, Lars here. Uh, it sounds odd, but we are done. This is the last review video you are going to get because in Unit 6, and you know I've said this before, uh, I know you're doing your final project. And I want you to be exposed to data structures, but you're not going to have the time to really delve in and do things with all of the different structures and all the different things. So as I always say, especially for students like you at the graduate school level, I think exposure is important, and then when you need to know something, you can go explore. You know, we're about handing out fishing poles, not fish, so I want to give you the ability to know what things are, and then go out and explore and do things on your own. We are going to do a little bit of an assignment with linked lists, but you'll see what that's all about in the future. So, this is going to be the only video, and basically what I've done with this one, similar to the one with searching and sorting, is there's a sequence I did about a year ago. I don't know. I was sitting in my office in science and it's good and the coverage is good so we're going to go back and do a greatest hits and I'm going to show you that lecture from that particular iteration but stick around because afterwards I'm going to do all the announcements and we're in the end game because I'm sitting here looking at my laptop and it's August 4th we're going to be done in nine days okay unit six ends on the 12th and the final projects are due on the 13th and I can't I can't push that, even in the slightest, because I need to have those grades up and ready to rock and roll for Regis, the grading system, by the 15th, which means I'm only going to have 48 hours to grade things, so that's a pretty tight window. Um, hopefully, I'm going to get some early, perhaps. I don't know. We'll see. I'll figure it out, and I always do, and it'll get done, and it'll be fine. All right, but it just seems weird because the summer shot by, and you guys know because you've been with me. When, when things began, I was living in my house in a touch in New Jersey, and now that house is completely gone, completely sold. All those things are gone. Everything I have is here in this apartment in New Brunswick, and now I'm completely here. And it still feels like I'm staying in a hotel. It still feels like someday a, a bellboy's going to knock on the door and say, it's time for you to leave. And then i got to go back home, so I'm still, it's not in my DNA yet. And I'm living closer to school. It's so convenient, too. It really is. And uh, I don't want to waste your time. All right. We're going to look at data structures. Data structures, as I always say, and I think, no, actually, I skip it, I think. I think I go right to stats and cues. Basically, it's the second course that you take if you go to university for computer science education. First, you take Intro to Computer Science, and you know this story. You take, uh, you get your first language via Java or C++ or Python, and you learn some computer science topics along the way. You're sorting and searching, you're recursion, you're big O, the things we did in Unit 4. And... The second class you take is this, it's data structures. It basically shows you how to organize your data in time-tested ways, so algorithms that we've come up with in computer science over the last 70 years work on them. And we show you that setting up your data this way kind of mimics different things that we do as far as problem-solving techniques for humans. Like with a stack, you're gonna see it's like a stack of plates and it helps you remember what came before what. And a queue is just a line, so it's good for scheduling and things like that. You'll see, you'll get the gist of it as we go along. So, without further ado, go ahead and take a look at this lecture on data structures, and then stick around, because at the end, I'm gonna give you a little, you know, some hints for getting unit six done, and some other things, and basically we'll wrap things up. All right, also we have class, our last class on Tuesday, so we'll talk a little bit about the format of that too, all right? All right, then enjoy the lecture, stick around at the end for the announcements, and I'll see you later, all right, bye. We're going to take a look at stacks and queues. I usually do them together. And if you remember from your slides, uh, stack is nothing but a pest dispenser. The first thing in is the last thing out. And you can see we have our little drawings there. So that's a fairly easy concept if you're familiar with pest dispensers. It's just like a pest dispenser. You push down, you push down, you push down. And then when you want to get one out, you pop it. And that's it. Now, the second closely related data structure to stacks is queues. Now a queue is just what it looks like. It's like a line in the grocery store. When you go into the queue, it basically tells you what came before, what came after. It's used for scheduling purposes. And instead of the first thing in being the last thing out, now the first thing in is the first thing out. Okay, it's more more fair, I guess, than you would think it would be with a stack. Um, stacks, theoretically, are more for remembering things. 
and cues are more for scheduling and keeping things in order. But let's do this. Let's look at some code. Hello, code. There we go. As you can see here, there's two things that we need to consider now that we're looking at data structures in our particular context. One is that we, thanks to beautiful Unit 5, know about object orientation. And object orientation lends itself nicely to these data structures. Because if you think about it, what is a stack? It's nothing but a list, but it's a list where we have different methods, push and pop, that do certain things with it. Now, the second consideration we have besides object orientation is that we're using Python. So Python has a lot of things already written for us that we can use. So when we deal with Python, and we're programmers that already know about object orientation, it's kind of neat because we can just use what Python gives us to implement what we want to implement. And as you can see here, I'm going to run it. And as you can see, let me put this right up here so we can take a look at it. At first, when I look at the stacks, and I will worry about this import statement in a second, but the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab a variable called stack1, and I'm going to put a list in it. So then what do I do when I want to push to this stack or I want to add something to it? I just use the append method, okay? Append is the same as push when we use a list as a stack. So I'm going to push the string test. I'm going to push the integer 2, and then I'm going to push the string test 2. Then I'm going to come down here. I'm going to say print. First we look at stacks, and then I'm going to use a method called pop. And lists, you didn't learn about it when you learned about lists. But if you go look in the online documentation, you'll see that list has a method called pop. And it's just what it is. It's so you can use lists as stacks. So if we go over here and we look at our results, we'll see first we look at stacks because we printed it. And then we're going to print stack one pop. Well, what do we get? We get test two. So test two was indeed the last thing we put in the stack. So if it's going to behave like a stack, the, the last thing we put in is going to be the first thing back out again, and that's what we get, test 2. Now, if we pop it again, test 2 has been removed, and now we get the 2. So this is acting like a proper stack, okay? Now, we look to queues, and a queue is just a line. We're not going to use a regular list when we do our queue, though. What we're going to do is we're going to go to the collections library, Look it up online in the online Python documentation. And we're going to import a class uh, called DQ. And we're going to get a DQ object. So I'm going to come down here. I'm going to get a value. I'm going to make it equal to DQ. We all know about object orientation right now. So DQ's constructor is going to get run. And I'm going to get that kind of object for my variable. And then I have two methods for DQ that let me treat it like a Q. One is append. Just like our stack, the, the, the push to the queue, or usually when we deal with queues, we call it an insert. But in this case, we'll just call it append. I do the same thing as I did above in the same order. String test, integer 2, string test 2, and then I start popping. But in this instance, I want to use the method pop left. So we come here. Now we look at queues. I do a pop left because I want to grab the other side. I want to have this act like a line in the grocery store or a queue. So I don't use pop. I use pop left. And what do I get? I get test. So the first thing that went in is going to be the first thing that comes out now because I want the, the behavior to be that of a queue. I do pop left again, and it's the two. It's the middle item, just like it was above. So what we, we have here is we have one is a stack data structure, and the stack data structure is so we can basically use it as memory. It's like I'm in the middle of doing something and you go, oh, I have to go do something else. So you push that thing to the stack, then you do what you have to do, then you pop it again so you can get it right back. It's almost like it acts as memory for small tasks. It's like, oh, I have to do this. Well, all right, I have to do this now, push it, and then push this, and then, okay, I'm done, pop it. Do that, pop it again, do that. That's how we use stacks in a computer science context. Cues are for quite simply scheduling because it seems simple but what do queues really tell you it, it tells me what went in before me it tells me what went in after me and even though i don't have to keep a specific time i do have that you know temporal sense of things that are coming before and after me so in computer science we use it for scheduling 
So stacks and queues are very are used throughout programming and computer science all the time. So it's definitely two data structures that you want to be familiar with and you want to have at least you know heard about. Okay, so that's pretty much the meat and bones of stacks and queues. In your slides, we then go on to talk about binary trees, but I think I'm going to save binary trees for last because what I really want to do in this particular video slash demonstration is I want to give you the skinny on linked lists. Do I? Nah, I don't need this anymore. Get rid of it. Um, but what I'm going to do first is I'm going to do a drawing, and hopefully I can do the drawing well. Um, when we have a linked list, the first thing we do is we introduce you to the concept of, oh, I'm trying very hard to do this well, a node, okay? And a node is an, um, an item in a list, but it's not just one single piece of data. It's two pieces of data. In here, you have your data. And in here, you have a memory location that points to the next item in the list. Because this is the secret. Back when we got used to storing things, you had memory where everything was all in a row. So the first item in the list would go here in the zero spot. And the next item in the list would go here in the one spot. The next item here would go here in the two spot. And so on and so on and so on. The problem is... To use memory well, sometimes you don't have your memory all in a row, or what's called contiguous. Sometimes you want to jump all over and use memory where you can find it. Can I get rid of Let me get rid of this. So a linked list allows us to do that because a linked list allows us to do what we call dynamic allocation. If I have a list and it's two items long, if I want to add that third item, all I have to do is go grab a piece of memory from anywhere because this pointer allows me to point to it. Now, I have a node, which is the data item or the payload, and then a little spot that points to the next item, but that's just a node. What I really want is I want a, an object called a linked list, and what the linked list is going to handle is two different things. The linked list is going to tell me, uh-oh, watch the spelling on this. Oh boy, that's bad. Look at that, I fixed it. Uh, there's an item called head, and what head does is it points to the first item in the list. And then the second thing a linked list keeps track of is what the size of the list is, and you'll see this gets handy later too. Okay, so if I have a linked list, I have, it points to the head. So my linked list is going to point to the first item in my list. This is a node. So what is this going to do? If there's only one item, it's not going to point to anything. It's going to have what's called a null pointer, or it's going to be zero. But if it, you do have a second item, let's say I have an item out over here, well, then this is going to point to it. Okay? And then I have my second item here. And then this will point to the third item in my list, and so on and so on. Now, the last item in the list is going to have... I'll just put an N there for null. That is a really weak N. Let's try that again. A little bit better. Oh, look, a little mark at the end, too. How wonderful. Um, so this is basically what a linked list looks like. And every time you insert something or add something to the end of the linked list, you would update your size variable. That would be basically a class variable. You learned about class variables in Unit 5. Okay? So that's for this simple context and for the simple thing we're looking at right here this is what a linked list is in a data structures course hopefully you know i know there's that course in camden where you can do data structures and algorithms and i sure they i'm sure they go over this there you could spend a month tooling around with linked lists because what you'll learn later is you this is a what's called a singly linked list if you had a doubly linked list your node would have three items. You'd have your data or your payload. You would have a pointer to the next item, but you would also have a pointer that it would allow you to go backwards. That would allow you to go to the one before, and that's called a doubly linked list. So with a doubly linked list, you can go to the end of the list and go all the way back. Here with this singly linked list, you can't really go backwards. Okay, 
And then what you would do is you would write different methods for your linked list object. You would have one called insert. So if I want to insert an item in the third spot, what would I do? I would come here. I would put, take my new node and I would have the pointer point to this one. And I would take this one and break that and have it point to this. So I would be inserting that item in the third spot. Okay? That's messy, so we'll get rid of that. Um, I could also write a delete. A delete is incredibly simple with a linked list because let's say I wanted to delete the second item. All I have to do is break this pointer and take this and point to this. <laughs> That's it. That's a delete because now this guy, he still exists, but he's out in space. When I look at the linked list, this is my first item and it goes to the second item. <laughs> so that's it. OK, so that's basically what a linked list is. It's non a list uh, in non-contiguous memory where your list item is a node that contains your payload or your data and then just a pointer that points to the next item in the list. OK, so if we want to implement this in code, I will come back to this later. Uh, let's see, I have a linked list, little piece of code called a linked list, but I also have a little piece of code that uses it. And if you look here, and you have this online because you're going to use this with your homework, I don't have one class here. I have two classes. I have node, okay, which contains data, and the next node. So I basically have what my payload is, and then I point to the next thing in the item. So that's my node. I have my payload. One thing is the payload. One thing is what the next thing is. Here it's a variable name. It's not a pointer to a memory location. And then I have my linked list. What does my linked list do? The two things we said it would do. It keeps track of the head, keeps track of where the top of the list is, and it has a variable to maintain the size. And size is zero right now. Um, this is actually an instance variable. I didn't use it as a class variable, like I said before. So what are my methods? My methods an insert. So I say insert a node. So if not the head, because if it's the head, we want to do something a little different, then make self.head equal to node. So basically what I'm doing is I'm kind of treating my object-oriented linked list as a stack because I'm pushing the object down and creating a new head every time I add something. And you're going to see when we run it. And then I'm increasing the side size. Now, if it is the head, then we have to do a bunch of other stuff down here. Okay. If I want to get the size, I have a getter for my size variable, which is increased in both cases. And here I put in a little print so we could print it. Okay. So when I use my list over here, I, you know, created a library because that's what we do. And I import everything from the linked list library. I grab a variable called my list and I make it equal to linked list. And then I start inserting things. So what do I insert? I insert nodes, okay? Because that's what linked lists have, nodes, all right? Uh, you can see up here, I don't call it a node, I call it an object. So my class accepts an object when it's created. So, although I didn't do it here. So when I do my insert, which takes a node as a parameter, I give it a node, I give it Lars, okay? And then I give it Alex. And then I look to get the size. Let me run it. Show you. Ooh, let me get in here. Okay, so what's going on? Down here. You can see when I run it, what do I do? I insert Lars, then I insert Alex. Then I do a get size. What's the get size 2? Then I insert Michael. Then I do a get size. What's the get size 3? Then I insert Avi. These names, these are all names of you know, students that I had. Uh, a couple of years ago when I used to teach Python to middle school kids in an enrichment program at an enrichment school called Heroes Academy in New Brunswick. Um, so I, I kept all their names here. <laughs> so that's the, these names aren't coming out of the blue. They were actually students that I had a long time ago. Good kids too, smart kids. Um, then what do I do? I come down here, oh, don't want to do that, and I use the print LL function. So I print my linked list. And what do I do here? I just start at the front node and I go through node and I keep printing until I run out of data. And so that's what I do here. But you'll notice the order. Abby, Michael, Alex, Lars. What do you notice about that order? It's like a stack. Okay. Abby was the last thing we put in, but it's the first thing out. So this linked list is like a stack. 
okay? So when we, when you're inserting things, you've got to remember whatever you insert is going to be the head of the list, all right? And that's going to help us out. Now, one thing that we have is I gave you a homework assignment. And that homework assignment was to write a method for linked lists. So when you write a method for linked lists, you would put it in here with the linked list code that prints a certain item in the linked list. Okay, so if I have this list right here, Lars, Alex, Michael, Abby, and I want you to print the second item, I want you to print Michael because Michael is the second thing in the list. Now, you're probably thinking, oh, my God, how do I do that? Let me, I'm not going to do your homework for you, obviously, but I can do something that may make things a little interesting for you. Let's go down here to the print LL method, okay? And let's just add a counter. Simple counter. Uh, yeah, do that. And now when I print the data, I'm not just going to print the data. I'm also going to print the counter. All right. So let's do that. Let's save that, run it. Nothing's going to happen because it's a library. But now if I come back here and I run my code again, now I get the number that it's put in. Aha, uh -huh, see? So that may help you down the line as far as your homework is concerned. Yes, yes, yes. All right, so that's basically it as far as a linked list is concerned. It's not a difficult concept. It's just I don't have all the memory right in a row to store what I need to store. So I'm going to create a structure where I have an item in a list and it points to another place and that points to another place. So I can now logically have a list of items, whereas physically they are not right in a row with each other. Okay, and that's all a linked list is. As you probably know already, this code is already up on the Sakai resource site for you to use. So you can use this code, take it, and then just add the different functions you have to add in order to do your homework. But if you play around with this code and you trace it and you understand how it works, you're going to understand linked lists. And, and the two homework items that you have shouldn't be that difficult once you have that context and that understanding, okay? Um, one last thing we're going to do, and I'm not even going to look at code with it, is we're just going to review binary trees. And what do we want to do here? Let's go new. Don't save. Yes, brand new. And we're going to look at binary trees. Now, I already told you about the concept of a node. So it's pretty much the same thing with binary trees, except here I'm going to have data or a payload in the middle. And then I'm going to have one side point to the left-hand side, or what we call a left leaf, and then this side is going to point to the right-hand side, or what we call a right leaf, and that's what a node looks like in a binary tree context, but when you see binary trees drawn, you usually see something like this, okay? Each one of these circles is a node, just like that, okay? So you have this node up in the middle, and this node points to another tree structure and then this node here only has a left leaf and it points to this uh, oh no I mean this one only has a left leaf and only points to this and this one has both but this one only has a right leaf and you're probably saying to yourself why in God's name am I storing my data in this fashion and part of the reason as you'll understand if you take a data structures course or you start moving on in computer science is that this kind of structure lends itself to being attacked recursively because if you think about it i have a binary tree node up here what do i have at either leaf another binary tree okay what do i have here two more binary trees this is a binary tree so if i have a recursive function and i run it here i say get right do i have a right leaf yes do i have a right leaf yes do i have a right leaf yes so it's basically, okay, is this still right? Run yourself again. Is this still right? Run yourself again. Is this right? Run yourself again. So it leads itself to recursion. Then is this right? No. Well, that's your tail condition. That's your end condition. Oh, really? No. So then I go up the leaf. And then I can check for lefts as I go and do other things like that. As you saw in your slides, there's different orders through binary trees, infix, postfix, prefix. So you can basically traverse and store data in a bunch of different ways. You'll see later, if you take that 
data structures course that binary tree structures are very good for sorting and searching. It allows us to find data really quick if things are stored in a binary tree structure. And you already got a little hint to some of that when we did binary searching in unit four. <clears throat> so this is all what binary trees are about. This, when you see something like this, that's what it is. It's a binary tree. And all it is is a node where the data is here and these two are pointers to what's off to the left and what's off to the right. And what's off and off to the left and off to the right is another binary tree. So we run recursive uh, methods and recursive functions on this particular structure. Okay? Not going to make you crazy with code on this one. Um, as you move forward in your data analysis, big data, uh, data science slash computer science careers, you are going to run into binary trees a lot. So you are definitely going to see some code and see some stuff on binary trees. And it, you could always Google it and look at it that way too. <coughs> but for brevity and for time's sake, we are not going to do that here. All right. Um, that's it. All right. We are back. Um, we're done. <laughs> it sounds weird, but there's only nine days left. Nine days is actually a decent chunk of time when you look at our schedule though and all of the things we've had to do with the, the summer schedule and the summer thing. But let me give you a piece of advice. And this is what I usually tell people to do. As far as unit six is concerned, just get it out of the way, okay? I gave you the assignment right from Jump Street. So you have the assignment now. It's not due to the 12th, but I didn't wait. I usually wait for a while because if I don't wait for a while, people look at the assignment and then when they read, they read to solve that problem. They don't read to learn and they don't read to get an overall breadth of information on the subject. I know, I've been there. It's not a it's not a knock on anybody. It's how we do things. You know, as humans, we look to get the job done. We mimic and we look to get the job done. So that's why I always, from a pedagogy standpoint, I always wait. I want you thinking about things in a general sense and getting some of these topics and ideas down before you zero in. So that's why I always wait a week before I do the assignments. And I'm not stupid. I know everybody just waits until the assignments are out and does it anyway. But at least if somebody wants to do it the right way, they have a chance. Um, and this one, no. I give it to you right away because what I say is this. Between now and maybe Wednesday or something like that, find that two-hour block. You're grown-ups. Shouldn't take more than two hours. And sit with Unit 6. Read the slides. Watch this video. Okay, I know you're getting it out of sequence because you're watching it now if you're hearing me. Um, then do the assignment. As you saw at the end of what you just watched, it's very similar to what we did with the counter. Just do the assignment now. Get it out of the way. It's the easiest 12 points you've gotten in this unit, in this course. Okay? And then take five to ten minutes and go to the forums and as you saw I don't expect half a page and there's no TED talk to watch but I do want a thoughtful decent review of the hybrid format you don't have to talk about this class but talk about the hybrid format whether you like having a good amount of your resources um, online and when things are hybrid, there's an asynchronous nature to the class. You can make your own schedule for doing 80% of the work. The only time you really have to worry about time is when you have to do quizzes and when you have to attend class. Um, do you think four classes was enough? Do you think there should have been more classes? Do you think there could have been less classes? And that is, as we advertise ourselves as a hybrid, we're more like a fully online course. Uh, we're trying a fully online course in the fall, in this fall. So what I'm going to end up doing is taping lectures and putting them up for the online cohort. So I'm, I'm curious. You know, it's, it's feedback for this course as far as I'm concerned. And it lets me know what's going on and what you think, all right? So do that. Take that two hours and just get Unit 6 right out of the way. And then all you have to do is concentrate on the final project. Because at the end of the day, that's the last deliverable, okay? Monday night by midnight, I need the demo which is either a PowerPoint or a Prezi or a YouTube video or a mixture of both. A lot of people will do a short pre, you know, PowerPoint presentation with a, with a YouTube video embedded. That's fine. I, don't, I may throw up one video that some students in the past have done, but I don't really give examples when it comes to the final project as far as the code is concerned 
and as far as the presentation is concerned because I want it to come from you and you've heard me say this before I whenever I throw up samples for the presentation or the design document then all I get is that format sometimes the the, the same sentence structure with your project slammed into the boilerplate I don't want that I want the ideas to come from you okay so with the final demonstration final code I definitely get that because I don't give you a lot of examples and what I'm going to send you is like a YouTube video which is crazy super production uber I don't expect you to be that good either it's just an example of what some of my former students have done whenever they do a good YouTube video I make it a favorite so I just have to look at my list of favorites and I can pick those out and I'll, I'll put those links in our in Sakai for us um, and that should be it for you guys okay everybody did great on the midterms I finished grading them I got them in your Dropbox yesterday so that if I don't think there was a single, let's put it this way, I don't think it was a, there was a single midterm that hurt a grade. I don't think there was a single midterm that wasn't over where your grade was sitting, okay? So midterms were good for you guys. I thought it was very interesting, and at the end of the day, as you know, because I wrote it in a lot of papers, I just want you to get extra practice. I want you to get extra practice with the Python, which is why I have you go out, watch the Harvard, and, watch, and do the Code Academy and learn Python the hard way, and at the end, Everybody got it. We could talk about it a little bit in class, but, well, we'll get to class in a second. But, you know, Harvard CS50 was a class. Learn Python the Hard Way is a book. Code Academy is an online tutor, okay? So the compare and contrast is between those three different methods, and it gets interesting. <coughs> anyway, everybody did great. You're in good shape with that. Unit 5, there's still some people who haven't handed in some assignments. A lot of points you're leaving behind. Likely the difference between an A and a B in this course. So you have until Sunday night, okay? You're going to lose a point, maybe two along the way, but it's still worth it to do that assignment and get it in. So I hope the people who haven't handed it in are still chugging along. I told Kit, you know, stand down. We're going to wait until Monday to start grading Unit 5 because we're waiting for people to get some stuff in that they haven't gotten in, okay? So we're waiting for it, so don't worry about that. All right, two things. The class... We're going to meet on Tuesday night, but we're going to go fast. I'm going to do, we're going to do some review. We're going to talk about some things. I want to make sure everyone's good with the final project. Then we're going to look at some stuff with gaming as far as, you know, using Pygame and doing some gaming stuff just to show you some of the stuff I do. And then we're going to be done. I want class time on Tuesday night to be for you and your group mates to work on your final projects. So there's some time for you built into the cake. If we get rolling at 4.30, I hope to be done literally by 5, maybe quarter after, so that you can start working with your groups and start getting things done, okay? So plan on that. If you want to talk to your group mates and say, hey, you know, make a list of things to do. Let's do A, B, C, and D. That's going to be time for you guys. I just, <laughs> I just looked over at the microphone. I turned it, a boom, boom, boom. I turned it around this time, so hopefully the audio on this segment is a little bit better. Just, I'm an idiot. I don't just, not a pro. <laughs> um, so class is, is going to be quick. It's going to be a little bit of a wrap-up, a little bit of a what have you learned, Dorothy. And then basically, if you take that time and bang unit six out, final project is going to be all you have left because we're it's end game. We're there. We're almost there. And you're Python programmers now, so congratulations. All right? As usual, if you have any questions, go ahead and throw them in the forums. Or send me an email my apologies to those people who sent me emails during unit, unit five i still feel bad when i don't answer them but i don't it's a tough love thing i throw you got to get, get thrown out of the nest at some point it's graduate school and you're not going to be able to email somebody in the real world when you have to solve a problem you need to just hunker down start googling and learn how to solve the problem and then solve it all right all right good 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 then i believe that is it and we are in very good shape so I am going to get out of here. You now officially have all your resources for Unit 6. You have your slides, your Zell readings, your... Do I even... Yeah, I do give a little Zell reading. Um, you have this video. You have the assignment. You have everything. And because you have all of your resources for Unit 6, you now have all of your resources for the entire course. And we're going to talk about that going forward when we meet in class because I like to leave the Sakai up and I like people to be able to have this course as a reference to go back and see and what you're going to see is that I have a website so that if Sakai archives itself or if Sakai goes the way of the dinosaur and we all start using canvas you'll still have a way to access these materials 
and see all of this stuff going forward, okay? You guys know it by now. This is a soft poet's entry into the world of Python, but now it's up to you to take that Python and learn more specific things and, and use better libraries and get rocking and rolling and, and do what it is you want to do with uh, computer programming, all right? All right, this was a really good class. You guys were good. And if again, if you have any questions, any issues, let me know about it in the forums. But this is a, an interesting ending video because I'm going to see you guys. I'm going to see you guys on Tuesday. So it's not the last time you're going to see me, all right? You be good. I will talk to you later, and I'm seeing you on Tuesday, all right? Bye.